So now that we've given you some basis for how the GI system works normally, from here we'll launch into all the different ways it can become diseased. Since it seems like a logical place, let's start at the mouth. We mentioned the components of saliva and the three paired salivary glands, so now we'll touch on the tumors that can occur in these glands. Usually these are benign tumors, and most are in the parotid gland. Pleomorphic adenoma is the most common, and it's benign. These present as painless, movable masses, and are associated with a high rate of recurrence. Worthen's tumor is another benign growth, but this is actually salivary gland tissue growing in a lymph node, what's known as heterotopic growth. The last tumor we'll mention is the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. This type of cancer has three cell types, squamous, intermediate, and mucus producing, and is the most malignant salivary gland tumor. In this image you can see mucus production toward the center of the glands. This is a funny phrase that's used to describe the feeling of a lump in one's throat, without any actual clinical or radiographic evidence to suggest that it should be there. It's usually triggered by a strong emotion and is completely benign. It's also known as globus hystericus, or globus pharyngeus. Next is achalasia. We mentioned this briefly before in the context of nitric oxide, and a lack of nitric oxide being implicated in some cases of achalasia. So let's take a look in more detail at this disease. It's defined as a failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES, due to the loss of the myenteric plexus. Because it can't relax, food does not pass from the esophagus to the stomach in its usual coordinated manner, and this gives the patient dysphagia to solids and liquids. If there were only obstruction, there would be no dysphagia to liquids. To diagnose this condition, you would do a barium swallow study that demonstrates a bird's beak appearance. This condition is associated with a heightened risk of esophageal carcinoma. Interestingly, achalasia can rarely be caused by Chagas disease, which you'll remember is caused by Trypanosoma cruzi. You should only think about this as an answer choice if the patient is a South American immigrant. You can also see achalasia-like pathology in Crest syndrome. Here we have a list of some well-known esophageal pathologies. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, is our medical term for heartburn, which can include regurgitation upon lying down. Even if a patient presents with nocturnal cough and dyspnea, GERD should definitely be a consideration on your differential. Esophageal varices we mentioned before in the context of portosystemic anastomoses. This is painless bleeding of the submucosal veins in the lower one-third of the esophagus. It's a common source of upper GI bleed in patients with liver disease. Esophagitis is a general term for conditions associated with reflux, herpes, CMV or cytomegalovirus, candida, or toxic ingestion. Mallory Weiss and Borhov syndrome are both caused by vomiting, and the exam will usually list both in the answer, so you need to be able to differentiate the two. Mallory Weiss is a tear at the gastroesophageal junction from severe vomiting, which usually occurs in alcoholics and bulimics. Borhoff syndrome is actually a transmural, or through-the-wall, rupture of the esophagus from violent retching, and it's a surgical emergency because bacteria can invade the mediastinum and cause devastating infections. In Borhoff syndrome, the patient may have some element of hematemesis, or bloody vomiting as well, but the main symptom here, as with any perforation of a hollow viscous, is pain. Pain, pain, pain. In this case, in the chest. Typically, a chest x-ray will show pleural effusions, and physical exam will reveal crepitus on the chest wall or subcutaneous emphysema. Esophageal strictures are a long-term consequence of lye ingestion or acid reflux. Lye is a very strong base. It's used for cleaning in many cases. Lastly, plumber vinson syndrome is an important triad of features. Dysphagia, iron deficiency anemia, and glossitis. Glossitis is an inflammation of the tongue, which causes it to appear swollen, and also change in color, which results in the surface of the tongue appearing smooth. The dysphagia, in this case, occurs secondary to esophageal webs. Barrett's esophagus deserves its own separate mention because it's such a highly tested topic. It's a classic case of metaplasia when one cell type changes to another cell type in response to its environment. The non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium of the esophagus is exposed to acid due to gastroesophageal reflux disease, and it undergoes metaplasia to become intestinal-type columnar epithelium in order to defend itself from the chronic acid load. This is associated with esophagitis and ulcers, but more frequently, it's a precursor lesion for esophageal cancer. Here you can see a picture of the metaplastic columnar epithelia, as well as the goblet cells. Normally, you would only see these in the small intestine. 
Now we'll mention esophageal cancer itself. Let's start with a question. Is squamous cell cancer or adenocarcinoma more common in the U.S.? The answer is adenocarcinoma, and we'll explain why. Barrett's, of course, is a risk factor for esophageal cancer, but you can also develop this condition through alcohol use, achalasia, cigarettes, diverticuli, esophageal webs, esophagitis, or uncommonly through hereditary familial mechanisms. The cancer typically presents as progressive dysphagia associated with weight loss. Dysphagia in an older individual with heartburn should make you suspicious for esophageal cancer, but if it's dysphagia in an older person with heartburn associated with weight loss, a hundred times out of a hundred you're dealing with esophageal cancer. Worldwide, squamous cell cancer is the most common because squamous cells are the usual lining of the esophagus. In the U.S., the most typical risk factor is Barrett's esophagus from GERD. Once those cells have undergone metaplasia to intestinal columnar cells, the cancer that develops from them is an adenocarcinoma. GERD's very common in the U.S., and the other causes are increasingly rare, so most cases are adeno here. Since Barrett's is in the lower region of the esophagus, just above the stomach, it's not difficult to see that adenocarcinoma is usually in the lower one-third of the esophagus, while squamous cell carcinoma is generally in the upper and middle two-thirds of the esophagus. You can remember the various risk factors for esophageal cancer with the mnemonic SAC on a bed, which stands for squamous cell carcinoma, whose risk factors include alcohol and achalasia and cigarettes. Meanwhile, adenocarcinoma's risk factors include Barrett's esophagus, esophageal webs, esophagitis, and diverticula. There are many different malabsorption syndromes, and all have similar clinical features. Diarrhea, steatorrhea, which is fatty stools, weight loss, and weakness. Some have additional features, which will be highlighted as appropriate. The first syndrome is tropical sprue, a relatively understudied illness that is considered to be an infectious syndrome because of its positive response to antibiotics. The illness is similar to celiac sprue, which we'll discuss in detail, but the difference is that tropical sprue can affect the entire small bowel. Whipple's disease is a malabsorption syndrome typically seen in older men that is caused by Trophorema whippoli, which is a gram-positive organism. Biopsy specimens show PAS-positive foamy macrophages in the intestinal lamina propria and mesenteric nodes. In addition to the typical diarrhea, weight loss, and weakness, patients also have arthralgias, or joint pains, and cardiac and neurologic symptoms. The mnemonic on the right will highlight the major symptoms as well as the histological finding of PAS-positive macrophages. Since PAS stain is only positive in a relatively small subset of other diseases, this can be a huge giveaway. Assume the patient will be a middle to older aged white male. Celiac sprue will cover shortly, but the most basic information is that autoantibodies to gluten or gliadin form and cause symptoms when patients eat wheat or certain grains. It's usually limited to the proximal small bowel. There are various disaccharidase deficiencies, lactase deficiency being the most common. Osmotic diarrhea is the main symptom, and biopsies show essentially normal-appearing villi. An interesting fact is that self-limited lactase deficiency can occur following a viral illness when the intestinal epithelium is damaged. It's relatively easy to test for possible lactose intolerance. Among the many ways include doing a lactose tolerance test, which is considered positive for a lactase deficiency if symptoms start once an oral load of lactose produces typical GI symptoms and if the glucose rises by less than 20 mg per deciliter. The latter makes sense since people who cannot digest lactose won't be able to take up the glucose monomers that it's made up of and should not have any considerable rise in blood levels of glucose following pure lactose administration. A-beta lipoproteinemia is a disease of children with typical malabsorption issues as well as neurologic manifestations. The pathophysiology of the illness involves a reduced synthesis of ApoB, which prevents generation of chylomicrons. Without chylomicrons, there's reduced secretion of cholesterol and VLDL from cells into the bloodstream, so those fats accumulate within the cells. The last syndrome we'll mention is pancreatic insufficiency. This can be due to many underlying causes, such as cystic fibrosis, which is one of the classic ways in which it's discussed. Because there's so many fat-digesting enzymes unique to the pancreas, without these enzymes, there's a loss of fat in the stool, known as steatorrhea, and also availability to absorb the fat-soluble vitamins. You would expect to see all fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies in a patient with pancreatic insufficiency, especially if it's long-standing. Celiac sprue, which we started to discuss before, is a malabsorption syndrome with the usual features of diarrhea, steatorrhea, weight loss, and weakness. These patients may have a skin rash known as dermatitis herpetiformis, 
Despite the name, it has nothing to do with herpes, though it does carry a moderately increased risk of malignancy. You normally see it on the extensor surfaces of the arms. The pathophysiology involves autoimmune intolerance to gliadin, which is a glycoprotein found in wheat and the major component of gluten. This is why this disease is also sometimes referred to as gluten intolerance. The antibodies are useful in testing for the disease, including anti-gliadin and anti-tissue transglutaminase, or TTG. Biopsies of the jejunum are typically performed to confirm the diagnosis, and this shows blunting of the intestinal villi and lymphocytes in the lamina propria. Patients can often have complete resolution of symptoms by following a restrictive gluten-free diet.